behind me now is Skinwalker Ranch, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about it. Uh, apparently, they have made it so that even though the property over this mesa belongs to someone else, you cannot technically film Skinwalker Ranch property unless it's a selfie, and then they can't do anything about it. And I mean, they have their cameras pointing out at other property. I tend to think that Skinwalker Ranch is a bit of a scam. I believe that something is happening here, I really do. I think that there's a lot of history, but it mostly died off in the 90s. There's a lot of Native American history. We're up in the Uinta Mountains. Uh, the Dominguez Escalante expedition came over here. It's very clear that there was fascinating things that happened here in early times. But if we pan around, you can see the uh, Homestead Site 3, and this whole ranch is kind of property. And apparently in the 90s, Robert Bigelow came out here. He was a billionaire fascinated with the paranormal. And back then, nobody really knew what was going on. They knew that there were guards in the guard towers and that people were walking around and doing all kinds of weird experiments, and people would bring their girlfriends out here basically just to scare them. But it wasn't until Bigelow sold it, and it was sold to somebody else. And apparently, it has become a very contentious issue. They're, they're milking this cash cow for all it's worth. I have Native American friends and the Yikaria tribe, and they say that a lot of these paranormal things, the Bigfoot, the Skinwalker, they're very sacred. And when you try to copyright the word Skinwalker, when you try to make Bigfoot into a mascot, when you literally make it so you can't say the word Skinwalker, even though it's supposed to be a sacred word that's kind of guarded a little bit on its own, that is incredibly just disrespectful to Native American beliefs. Not to mention the fact that we're up here in northern Utah and Skinwalker territory is down near Four Corners. We're hundreds of miles away from that and the majority of the sightings around here are strange lights and orbs and things that would have been reported by people like Coronado and the Spanish expeditions. In fact, the mountains up there, the Uinta Mountains, the early Spanish explorers came right up over those mountains. It's mostly tribal land right now and we can't go on it. But this whole place, the history of it's all mixed up and uh, hopefully I get to the bottom of it a little bit. The more I hear about some of the sleazy practices that they, you know, employ on the Skinwalker Ranch, the more honestly mad I get. And the one that started it was, apparently they're doing an experiment in this triangle where they go up 5,000 feet in a helicopter or whatever, and they drop out a bunch of water bottles with these GPS trackers in them. Well, the locals find them all over the mesa on the neighboring ranches, and none of them have GPS trackers in them. They're it's, it's entertainment. It's not educational. Remember that when you watch TV, even when you watch the news. Uh, and then the thing that really, really made me mad was this is basically just a entertainment property. So they don't actively have their own cattle. They bring in cattle of neighbors. And, uh, you know, the neighbors say, if I can use my cattle as movie props and feed them for free on 500 acres, that's, that's great. But they had them sign non-disclosure agreements. So I will not reveal the neighbor's name. Uh, apparently, he approached these film guys and said, this cow is very old and very sick, so please treat her well. Don't load her in and out of the trailers. Well, they loaded her in and out of the trailer all day long, and she died. And in the movie, in, in season one, they try to make it look like, oh, a UFO or something killed her. And uh, they, they even put a little flying saucer over the body. Season two, another rancher brought his cattle out here. One of them died, and they left it out in the field. So now locals say there's probably going to be a mysteriously dead... Uh, well, this was in season three, rather. But they're going to say in the next season that there's a mysteriously dead cattle out here. Because although most ranchers will take the cows or whatever animals die and put them off in like a hole or a, uh, a ravine, they just left it sit out in the open. And it's these practices that are just, it's cruel to animals. And the warden, the game warden on the reservation gets calls all day, every day from people around the world that are concerned that these film crews are using the animals more or less as bait for the skinwalker. When in reality, they let these animals roam around and they don't guard them from the reservation dogs or the feral dogs, which roam in packs. They bite them, they kill them, and then they try to always make it look like the skinwalker did it or the aliens did it. now is the command center, the helicopter pad and the silo where they bring you if you have headaches out on the ranch. I should specify, I have since heard from a local, they do see skinwalkers out here, or people say they see skinwalkers. I'm not going to discount the beliefs. I don't want to, 
you know, step on someone else's sightings because I believe every belief and every sighting is valid. And I don't believe that somebody, because the story I heard was he was a very respected member of the community. It might be skinwalkers. I mean, I'm going to keep an open mind out here. But uh, I'm showing you with my face in the picture because technically we're not allowed to film the command center just on its own. My face has to be in the shot for legal reasons. But uh, a really fascinating area. They also see, apparently from the hills, there's this these glowing or uh, kind of shaky smoke balls about the size of, I heard it, a medium-sized dog with no legs. And they have red eyes and they come down and they will do the sage cleansing and say, you're not welcome here, and they'll go back up. And I heard that that was from a tribal member. Well, somebody else who grew up around this area said that they saw them and they knew other people who saw them when they were kids hiking in the canyons and their parents told them they were just imagining things. And you can imagine what you would feel as you got older and you started hearing that multiple people were seeing this. It's no longer just the boogeyman under your bed. It might be something that's very real. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to discount what people see out here. So you really should do the tour. It's the UFO Valley Campground. You should come on out here. It didn't to be, but a part of it, I, I think, I don't know, I'm not a rancher man. Yeah. Do people feel a, a, an akinment? To their land? I think they do. You can, but I think what it seems like to me, if I was, uh, if I were to guess, uh, he probably moved to a smaller ranch that just wasn't big enough to uh, handle all of the cow, uh, the, every head of cow that he had. I mean, he must love ranching. Two hundred k, you got that in the bank. Mm -hmm. and sell all of your cattle. And so, overlooking the kind of command post here, we've got, and behind me. It, you've got the command post, but we're not supposed to film it directly even though they're filming us But this is all private property owned by the UFO Valley Tour Company. I'll put a link to their website and uh, This is kind of where they say they see all the activity and it shows up in the show quite a bit and this road right here you take it right on up over the Mesa and if I pan over two feet to my right you'll be able to see all the places you'll see on the show and apparently on the show, they do a lot of stuff about the caves that go underneath the mesa. And this isn't uh, limestone. With limestone, you get the big caverns. I won't go under this because there's some seismic activity here. But uh, it kind of goes underneath the mesa. And the caverns are limestone. This is sandstone. So you can see it kind of forms in layers, even though it's not good for water flowing through and making big tunnels. So when the water flows through the sandy layer, it leaves the harder sandstone and shelves, which fall off. So there's little cave areas like this, which you can technically go right underneath here and come out the other side, just like right on the opposite side of this outcropping. Up ahead of us now are the Uinta Mountains. And I think the Uinta Mountains are fascinating because I am actually trying to make a legitimate history video. I think that the history of these places is worthy of being talked about on its own, outside of a paranormal aspect. And the links that I'm following are the uh, Rivera expedition of the 1760s and the Dominguez Escalante ex expedition, which we know actually made it up over this mountain range. And as I understand it, Spanish expeditions were to proselytize to the Native Americans. The Dominguez Escalante expedition was to make it over to the monasteries in Monterey and establish the Santa Fe Trail, which is kind of like their version of the Oregon Trail, linking Spanish colonies together from Santa Fe de Nuevo, Mexico to Monterey. And uh, they came up over these mountains. But a ulterior motive they had was to find treasure. And the Spanish love talking about buried treasure. And what they would do is they would go north out of their territory because uh, Abaquiwi, I believe, just northern New Mexico, it was their frontier. And they would talk to Native Americans and the Native Americans would give them little tips. And the Spanish would say, do you know any people wearing armor or people that have gold or people that have lost mines? And then the Native Americans would say, oh, we hear a lot of strange things happening up here. So one of the earliest expeditions, the Coronado expedition, they went far east, I believe to the panhandle of Oklahoma or, or into Kansas. And uh, it was pretty well documented that four members of their expedition were around this local lake and sand pit. I'll put the name in here. Uh, and they were, you know, enveloped by these green orbs. And in a flash of light, they just disappeared. And uh, these kind of things, they would follow the Native Americans. When well, the Native Americans said, oh, these strange occurrences happen around here. And the Spanish were very inquisitive and they would be like, oh, let's go. And <laughs> that's what led them, I think, to this part of the mountains. Because you have all the legends of Kerishinab and the Lost Roads Mines 
And a lot of things happened up here. I was in fact told that they have found cannons and stuff and old mine stones up in the mountains, the Uintas, but it's all on tribal land. And everybody that goes up there, they have an ulterior motive. They want to find the lost gold mines. So they're never actually searching for history, but I think that the history needs to be found. And I hope one day it does. So as I'm coming back from the Moab Japanese internment camp, I come across this little twilight zone beef jerky slash gas station, and I ask the guy, because there's a bunch of Area 51 and alien stuff around it, if he's ever seen anything out here. And he says people see things all the time. And he says that even though we're down in Moab, we are about 40 miles away as the crow flies from the reservation where they see a lot of skinwalkers. And he says that the skinwalker was a Navajo curse, not against necessarily the Ute people, but against the Ore people. Because he said uh, it's on some reservation reservation and I said the Ute and he says actually no they've got two separate reservations up in the mountain ranges and then he says well if you're looking for something you can go about five ten miles down the road here and take exit he even drew me a little map that feels like a treasure map uh, take exit 182 and uh, I go across the highway past the 7-eleven uh, about three miles once you pass the four-way through a RV park, and then that is the Thompson uh, petroglyphs. And so you go a couple miles down this paved road, and the main panel's on the left. But if you get out and you walk around, you see older panels. And Larry said, and I remember his words, he said, the larger they are, they say, the more bad medicine. And he says that the four figures on this panel are probably some of the biggest of the these style of petroglyphs. But that stuck with me, that... The larger they are, the more bad medicine. So we're going to be seeing that area, and uh, I think it'll be very interesting because it's only about 15 minutes away from here on the exit to Moab. I found this neat little piece of agate and I don't know if the camera is going to zoom in on it properly but you got a beautiful fossil right down there in the corner. I'll leave it where it is but interesting geology out in this part of Utah. And look at that, 
found a little bit of turquoise in the canyon. To end the video, I wanted to give a little bit of information more specifically about this. The barrier canyon style are the main petroglyphs of what you're seeing. The entire canyon was important for ancient people. But the barrier canyon style is the one with the large eyes, the red paint, and the long or elongated bodies, very alien looking. And the barrier canyon style is very distinctive to Utah, but it's found in a lot of the valleys around here. And I wanted to also say that this is quite a ways away from the Navajo homeland. And there is a lot of apprehension in talking about the Skinwalker, especially by the Navajo. And the Skinwalker legend, as far as I'm aware, is not known to the Ute people. But a lot of these tribes keep their history about subjects like the Skinwalker very close to their heart and try not to share it too much with white people because they're afraid that white people will use this as a means of scaring people away from land or turning a profit, essentially what they did with several other Native American sort of legends and sacred sites. And I just wanted to say that this is a beautiful place to visit, and if you do so, please go with respect. And if I were you, I would also bring an offering of tobacco. That's kind of a traditional offering, and it can't hurt anything to split open a cigar and scatter it into the cane.